Today we come to the age of Francisco Goya, an age of hope and disaster, and the age of revolution. There is no evidence throughout history that revolution, in the sense of a systemic overhaul, you know, an upside down turn, ever turned out well, regardless of the ideology. In fact, an inverse relationship appears to exist between the promises and the outcomes. So when people call for a revolution to phenomenally increase your living standards or award you 200 virgins in heaven, man, you be careful. Of course, many historical events, such as the so-called American Revolution, are really not revolutions. The American Revolution is probably more appropriately called, in Thomas Jefferson's words, a little rebellion, now and then, because those on top before the revolution were still on top after. It was basically the leading citizenry of America wanted to continue their lifestyle. Without having to pay someone on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean to tell them what to do, the French Revolution and the Russian October Revolution are cleaner examples of revolutions. The Chinese Communist takeover fit the definition. An upside-down turn did take place, as someone once joked to Cai Yuanpei, the president of the Beijing University. That if he paid Mao Zedong 16 yuan a month as a library assistant instead of eight, Mao probably would not have gone extreme and caused so many unspeakable disasters in China. As a reference, professors made 240 to 280 yuan in those days. Lu Xun, a famous writer, made 420 yuan a month. After the communist takeover, Mao used repeated political movements. To punish the intellectuals, forcing them to be re-educated by the laborers, peasants, and soldiers. However, the mechanism of the CCP takeover was more complex. To oversimplify, it was a case of the Communist Party, decisively backed both militarily and financially by Stalin, defeating the fascist party the Harry Truman refused to support. I don't know Truman's take on communism. But he was FDR's compromise choice of vice president because Truman's predecessor was considered too close to communism. In a sense, Spain was truly lucky when fascists defeated the communists in a civil war. Stalin did not repeat the mistake when China came around. The fascist party of China, A.K.A. the Kuomintang, was driven to Taiwan. Both Spain and Taiwan became stable democracies in the 1980s, while China remains the biggest headache for the world. We are getting ahead of ourselves. Let's get back to the beginning of the story. Francisco Goya, who was born 43 years before the French Revolution, was lucky. When entering the field of art, his family connections helped him. To become Spain's principal designer of the royal tapestry works before he was 30. Only two years later, he became the court painter, a position that El Greco wanted but couldn't get more than a hundred years ago. This is Charles III by Goya. This is Charles the Fourth. This is the Queen Marie Louisa. Look at the painting. Who do you think wears the pants in this family? The correct answer actually is that the country was run by her lover. I haven't been to Prado for a while, so I don't have pictures of details. But you can probably imagine the magic of these brushworks. 
How far did Van Gogh need to improve to reach the Musée d'Orsay version of the Starry Night that we have discussed in episode three? Also, we see that Spain was seriously tolerant to its artists. Goya put himself in the painting. Velasquez has put himself in this painting, Las Meninas or the Ladies in Waiting. But that was a painting of a child princess, her ladies in waiting, midget dogs, etc. We're talking about the royal family here. Think about it. Also, this seems to be a habit of Goya. Look at this painting called. The family of the Infante Don Luis was he a member of the family? This is a painting called the Duchess of Alba, also known as the Black Duchess, to distinguish it from another painting. Goya was at least affectionate with her. Look at her pointing to the writings on the sand. Solo Goya or only Goya. The letters were facing. The Duchess, as if she had written it in the sand. I'm sure that was not the result of a discussion about who should paint her picture. One of her rings also said Goya. Look at the way Goya did her dress. I apologize for the quality of the image. This is the best I could find on the internet. I don't know if you notice that these figures in the paintings are not nice looking. Dare I say vulgar? Since Goya clearly did not paint any of these with disrespect, the paintings show how confident these people were. It appears to be a case of confidence begetting tolerance, and tolerance begetting developments. Something especially important in the field of art. This is the famous painting called La Maha Desnuda, or the Nude Maha. What's wrong with this picture? Do you think that the head was put on the body incorrectly? If you don't agree with me, just keep looking at the head a little longer. You will see. The head obviously does not belong to the body. This painting is said to be the first total profane life-size female nude in Western art, without pretense to allegorical or mythological meaning. Let's also look at the breasts, especially the right one. Have you ever seen any breast standing up like this? The problem is because Goya painted from memory rather than live models. Nature sometimes. Was too intricate for even Goya to remember. Daumier, Degas, and Bonnard are known to do the same. This clothed Maha, La Maha Vestida, that he did some ten years later, does not have that problem. One of the problems for the painters. Is that viewers' eyes are conditioned to notice very small discrepancies, so painters have a very small error tolerance to work with. So far, we discussed the gentle, pleasant, or easy side of Goya. Maybe he was a little cocky, but we have no trouble seeing him as a typical, maybe spoiled court painter. There is another side of him. In the late 1792 and early 1793, when he was 46 years old, Goya was sick. We don't know his problems exactly, but the illness left him stone deaf. The king did not abandon him. Besides keeping him on, the king took the trouble and learned sign language, so he could communicate directly with him. 
also in 1799, some six years after he was dead, Goya was made the principal court painter, with a significantly increased salary. In Goya's time, the French salon was already functioning in Paris, but unlike Dali or Picasso, Goya had no need for the French market. He had enough money to be as cocky as he wanted. Goya, and as another example, Gaudi's works in Barcelona, make me feel that Spain has a tradition to spoil its artists. Maybe not immigrants like El Greco, but definitely native ones. Let's look at the series called Los Caprichos or The Caprices, a series of eighty etchings. And agua tints depicting a wide variety of subjects, including the clergy, prostitutes, and witches. This is plate forty-three. The writing here means word by word, the sleep of reason produces monsters. This is an agua tint. Which is a method for the metal to hold color in microscopic reservoirs to color an area. If you're curious about it, you can check out details on the internet. It is basically a chemical etching process. Many believed that it depicted the scene of Goya falling asleep himself. Today, we call this post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. The trauma is probably his illness. What I'm trying to say here is that once people have nightmares like these, the nightmares tend to come often, unpredicted, and maybe severe, not necessarily during the sleep, forcing the victims to be always on guard, and leading them to unreasonable behaviors such as unable to trust anyone. On top of that, it was frustrating time in Spain. Napoleon, the man of Napoleon Code, of the educational reform that set up France as one of the leaders in scientific and art development, of promotion of industry and trade, of tax reform, and of land reform, turned out to be a dictator who imposed his brother as a ruler of Spain. This is not a history program, so we are not going into details. Let's just say that Hitler, of all people, left Franco alone because he did not want the trouble that Napoleon had. Goya did not write much. Perhaps that was his way of avoiding controversies, so he's able to make his paintings clear. Somehow, the illness triggered a nerve in Goya, and drove him into what we would call today modern art. One painting that everyone must cover when talking about Goya is the 3rd of May, 1808. The revolt on the day before was crushed by the French occupation forces. Retaliation came the next day. More than a hundred were executed this way. Of these five men, these two were defiant. This man was scared. So were these waiting in line to be executed. This one is doing something else, praying, thinking about his wife. Now we come to the main character in white. Is he scared, screaming, "Stop! I'm innocent." Judged by his tanned face and fair body skin color, he was probably a laborer. Working in the field, so it appears that the French were executing people randomly to terrorize the population, an action designed to cause nightmares. Before this group of individuals was Napoleon's war machine, inhuman human machine. I count at least eight of them acting in total synchrony. Facing the fascist machine, in the original meaning of the word in Italian, individuals had little hope. 
in Los Caprichos, Goyer clearly saw monsters. Now the monsters were in the shape of the French troops. I want to point out that the fate of those who surrendered to fascism, shown here as the French soldiers, were just as sad. In a more straightforward case, Hitler's troops that swept Europe comprised more than 13 million proud German youth, trying to belong, hoping that they would be better off joining. The problem is that I don't think Hitler himself ever assaulted a Jew. These human machines make the world hell. Do people in Hong Kong today have any hope? That leads us to our last series. After purchasing a house named Ginta del Sordo, or Villa of the Deaf Man near Madrid, Goya started painting directly on his walls. The paintings are collectively known as the Black Paintings. The paintings were heavily damaged and badly restored onto canvases. This one is called Saturn Devouring. His son. It was painted on the wall of the dining room. I'm not kidding. Goya dined with this image. Let's compare it with this Saturn by Rubens. At least the baby still had his head. The first thing that comes to anybody's mind should be, what the? <laughs> Is this guy evil, repulsive? But wait, maybe we should take after Charles the Fourth. And be tolerant enough to give it another look. If morbidity could ever be the source of sublime, this is probably it. Let me quote the devil directly. It is a little long, but I think it is worth quoting. Here is what Edmund Burke said: "Whatever is fitted, in any sort, to excite the ideas of pain." And danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible, or is conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is the source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. I say the strongest emotion because I am satisfied. The ideas of pain are much more powerful than those which enter on the part of pleasure. Without all doubts, the torments which we may be made to suffer are much greater in their effect on the body and mind than any pleasures which the most learned voluptuary could suggest, or. Than the liveliest imagination, and the most sound and exquisite sensible body could enjoy. Nay, I am in great doubt whether any man could be found who would earn a life of the most perfect satisfaction at the price of ending it in the torments which justice inflicted in a few hours on the late unfortunate. Regicide in France, but as pain is stronger in its operation than pleasure, so death is in general a much more affecting idea than pain. Because there are very few pains, however exquisite, which are not preferred to death. Nay, what generally make pain itself, if I may say so. More painful is that it is considered as an emissary of this king of terrors. When danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight, and are simply terrible. But at certain distance and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are delightful. As we every day experience, quote unquote. Maybe from the wall to the dining table is far enough. 
I think that for the sake of humanity, any half-wit school would have its students read Burke. Of course, I don't mean reading only Burke. The opposite view, such as the writings and speeches of Hobbesby, are easily accessible. The question is, do we really want to get into the same fratricidal disasters every hundred years or so, when living memories of the disasters are no longer there? That is for the West. For China, in the span of a hundred years, it is capable of repeating the same disasters quite a few times, tens of times, if you count the minor ones, because China is a more acute case of collective and government-enforced amnesia of history. Most of the Chinese blame that on the authority, instead of their own laziness. But in my experience, so long as one is curious and works on it. Even the Chinese, during the much more isolated Cultural Revolution, can find the truth, or at least the half truth, enough to make some critical judgments correctly. Many friends of mine returned to China in the 1990s to make more money. I don't even dare to ask them whether they regret their decisions. Let's end this program on a lighter note. This one is called the Milkmaid. Goya painted it after he retired to Bordeaux, France, in 1824, at the age of 78. Look at the brushwork; just enough to make the scarf look transparent. An argument could be made here that the play of color was better than that of Monet, and the wet technique exceeded Van Gogh. What do you think? I think that we can safely say that Goya died happy and content at the age of 82. I heard that the Van der Bordeaux had excellent, even at Goya's time. I'll see you later.